That song, The Goodness of God, has been on my little playlist I looped through when I'm the uh, last several weeks, and I've been asking our worship team to play it, and they did a beautiful job. Thank you for blessing us with that song, for leading us so well, Anton and Ricky. We're really grateful for you. Thank you. <laughs> Not just because you played it beautifully, which you did, but because of what it contains, the goodness of our God, and that's why we're here. Let's ask our good God to speak to us now through his word. Father, you are good and you are great, and all our lives you've been faithful even when we're not faithful to you. And now you are faithful, God. We ask you to speak to us through your word, which you've told us is living and active and sharper than a double-edged sword, able to pierce our thoughts and our intentions. We don't always like that, but we need it. And so speak to us, we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. I bet every parent in here, grandparent in here, aunt in here, uncle, all of us in here, uh, have at one time or another heard a child, our child or somebody else's child, say the phrase, that's not fair. Right? How did you know that? How did you know what I was going to say? We, 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 did you, now, moms and dads, grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, did you have to teach your kids the, that phrase? No, they sort of just knew, didn't they? That's not fair. That is not fair. They grew up with this sort of innate sense of what, how things ought to be fair based on their little way of viewing the world. See an image here on the screen of my kids. This is in Colonial Williamsburg uh, in the stocks. That's what we did to our kids when they were complaining about fairness. <laughs> no, no. We were there for a celebration. My, uh, my, my, my wife's parents lived there for a time. And uh, Hannah's got her uh, outfit on from the colonial days. And the boys, you know, it's got to be fair. They need something. So we got them three-cornered hats. But then Ben wanted a musket. But, you know, if, is it fair if he gets the long rifle and Noah gets the short musket? We had to figure all that out, right, in the fairness. And in fairness to them, they weren't really fighting. But we stuck them in the stock so they would get over it. We all, and when we grow up as adults, we still have these conversations, don't we? You don't, you don't complain the same way you do as a kid, but you still look at the world, don't you, and say, that doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem fair. I don't think he deserved that promotion. I don't think, I don't think she, uh, uh, the people know how she really behaves. It doesn't seem right. It seems unjust. Or maybe not just the, the, your immediate circumstances. You look out at the world in general, and you see suffering, and you see things going on, and you think, why do the wicked win? Why aren't the Bears in the Super Bowl? It's not fair. <laughs> and the, 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 we could press on, all kidding aside, the questions get more serious about fairness and about justice when we look out at the world. That's a question that is, uh, the biblical authors wrestled with, in particular the authors of the book of Psalms wrestled with. It's a question we're going to wrestle with here this morning. Fairness, justice, injustice. How do you reconcile the goodness of God we sang about with the injustice in the world that we observe and see and experience on an almost daily basis. Last week, if you were here in our series Songs of the Soul, Pastor Jason Cusick, who's pastor of Journey of Faith Church in Manhattan Beach, California, a dear friend of mine, came and preached and it was across all of our campuses. And if you missed that, let me encourage you, you can go back and listen to any of our sermons. And if you have the time to do just one, go back and listen to last week's sermon if you missed it. He talked to us about, as Christ followers, what do we do as Christians when, with feelings of despair, anxiety, depression, fear? Where do we go? How do we handle that? And I thought I did a beautiful job of talking about the way God wants to meet us in our pain. If you missed that, even if you didn't miss it, I encourage you to go back and listen to it again uh, and share it with somebody who might need it. And he was preaching on what we call Psalms of Lament. A lament is essentially a complaint, crying out against something. And he looked at Psalm 22 and Psalm 42, crying out uh, to God about what's going on in my soul. We're going to look at a different kind of lament this morning, Psalm 10, which is not a lament about what's happening in here, but a lament about what's happening out there. When I look out at the world and I see what's happening out there, and I cannot make sense of that with what I know to be true about God and his word, I cry out, I complain, I lament. Let's look at Psalm 10 together. You can follow in your own Bible or on the screens. Psalm 10, we'll read the whole thing. And by the way, uh, you'll notice in your Bible, Psalm 10 does not have a title or an author indicated where Psalm 9 does. Most scholars think Psalm 9 and 10 were originally one long poem of David. It was subdivided for reasons we don't, didn't come down to us through history. But it's probably one poem, and this is the second half of the poem where David laments about injustice in the world. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? 
In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages. In hiding places, he murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation, that you take it, may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and to the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. The psalm begins with an honest question, and it ends in, in a glorious resolution. And in between, it gives us what I might suggest is a framework for how we, as God's people, ought to handle our own questions about injustice. What do we do with them? Here's the big idea. I'll give it to you in a statement uh, of Psalm 10. If you wanted to boil it down, here's the big idea of the psalm. In the face of great injustice, God has not forgotten the afflicted, and neither should we. Despite how it looks and feels, in any given moment, God has not forgotten those that are oppressed and afflicted, and neither should we. This is a promise for us to cling to and a mandate for us to obey, especially in times when we are tempted to despair or have feelings of helplessness. A number of years ago, my wife and I took a trip to Zambia, Africa, to visit a cure hospital that we support as a church to see God's work there. Uh, it was, in many ways, a great inspiration to us, uh, a privilege to be around these people that are doing remarkable work for the Lord in this part of the country, which we would never would have seen or known about otherwise. One of, I remember one aspect of the trip vividly. We were in this, uh, this van. We were going on what they called house visits to visit from the hospital some of the fairly local, local is a relative term in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, patients who had had procedures and wanted to see how they're doing. And we're bouncing along these roads through Zambia, these narrow, bumpy roads, and I'm looking out the window and just these dirt, dusty roads on every corner. I mean, hundreds of faces of children, men, women, some crippled, some missing limbs, some just lay in the dirt begging, all looking horrifically poor. And I remember sitting in the van, we're on our way to visit one child and one family and one part of one town and one country and one giant continent in this big world. I remember thinking, it's overwhelming, the number of people, just out the window alone on that short drive, who are in desperate, desperate situations. It, it, you ever felt that way? Maybe not driving through Zambia. Do you ever look, do you ever look at your, 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 your Facebook feed, cable news networks, or just life in general bombarding you with bad news all the time? What do you do with it? It can feel overwhelming. What do we do? Well, what do we do in the face of injustice? Psalm 10 shows us three things. First, we cry out to God. We don't stick our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. Sometimes we jokingly laugh that in our house, you know, the, the news is bad news all the time, so we'll just flip to the office reruns. Hey, let's just watch the office and laugh. Just want to ignore it. Just want to get a break from it for a while. Sometimes that you feel that way. But as Christ followers, we don't stick our head in the sand and pretend it's not there. We cry out to God honestly about it. God, I know your character in your heart. God, I know what your word says about you. But I look at the world and what I see and what I experience, I can't reconcile with what I know to be true. I don't understand. I can't make sense of it. It's okay to say those things to God. Psalm 10 verse 1, 
And in, in verse 11, you notice in verse 1, David cries out and says, where are you, God? Why do you hide yourself, God? And in verse 11, we read that the arrogant, the wicked says, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He'll never see it. They're both expressing the same thing from different perspectives. One longing for God to be there. One saying, God isn't here and I can do what I want. Do you remember when Pastor Cusick last week talked to us about the difference between true facts and true feelings? Do you remember that? It's what's happening here. Why do you hide your face, God? God has hidden his face. Neither are true facts, but they're both expressing how they view the world in that moment. So we cry out to God. In verses 3 through 9, David gives us a description of what he calls the wicked. Even that phrase, the wicked. I, I don't know what you, comes into your mind. Maybe you think of the, 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 the show, play, whatever. You think of the wicked witch or something. The wicked just sounds like those are the bad people. It's easy to distance yourself from this. I do it. You do it. We read, the, oh, the wicked. Those are those really bad people out there who do awful things. For example, this past week we had a number of uh, days set aside to remember of the Holocaust. And we saw documentaries and people remembering the evil, the horrible, unspeakable evil of the Nazi death camps. It's easy to think, oh, the wicked, that's those people that do terrible, terrible things. Get them, God, get them. But I, I, don't be so fast. Because when David gives us anatomy of the wicked here in verses 3 through 9 about all the things that they do, they oppress the poor, they cheat for their own gain, they exploit people, they're corrupt, Yes to all that. But there's one characteristic they share throughout. And it's not actually the actions they take or the things that they do. Do you know what it is? It's how they view God. Did you notice how often that comes up? We see it over and over and over again. In verse 3, the wicked renounces the Lord in his heart. In verse 4, does not seek him. Says in his heart, he will never see. In verse 11, God has forgotten in verse 13, he says that God will never call to account. Now, it's important that you see this is not something the wicked people are standing on the street corners shouting. There is no God. There is no God. That's not what they're doing. It's the things that they think and what goes on in their heart. It's what they believe and how those thoughts and beliefs and convictions influence how they act. Meaning they deny, reject, ignore the presence and reality of God in the world. And that inevitably leads to corruption, oppression, darkness, and injustice. Well, do you ever deny, ignore, resist, or reject the presence and reality of God in your life? I do. Those are the seeds. That's the seedbed of what David calls the wicked. You think, Pastor Jeff, are you calling me wicked? Well, if the text fits. I'm calling myself that. I'm saying it's not just the external actions that are easy to judge as bad, quote unquote bad. I'm saying inside every one of our hearts lurks this place where we want to deny, resist, ignore, and reject the presence and reality of God. And that, left unchecked, inevitably leads to brokenness, corruption, oppression, and injustice. It always does. Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his book, The Gulag Archipelago, a tough name to say and title, writes, the line that separates good and evil passes not through states or nations, not between classes or societies, not even between political parties, but right through every human heart. Even, with the, even within the hearts overwhelmed by evil, one small bridgehead of good may remain. And even in the best of all hearts, there remains a small corner of evil. The line that divides good and evil is not out there in them. It's in here in your heart and in mine. And even in the best of hearts, the best of us, there lurks this part of us that wants to deny, reject, ignore, and resist the work of reality of God. So let's not to be too quick to judge the wicked. We should examine our own hearts as well. Second thing that Psalm 10 teaches us to do is to, in the face of injustice is to cling to faith. We cry out to God with honest emotions, and that's good, and we should. The Psalms give us the language for which we can, with which we can cry out to God honestly. Pastor Jason talked about, to us about that last week. You, you can and you should cry out to God with honest emotion, but the Psalms don't leave you there. That's not meant to be your permanent address. 
I mean, if the psalm ended in verse 11, there is no God. He'll never see. He'll never, he'll never call to account. That would be depressing and despairing, and where would be left? The psalms move us from a place of honest crying out to God to a place of faith, clinging to faith, despite how it feels in a moment. By The way we cling to faith is by speaking the language of faith to our own hearts. We need to learn how to do this. You need to learn how to do this if you're going to follow God in this world. You need to learn how to speak the language of faith to your own heart, regardless of your circumstances and how it feels in a moment, to declare the truth to yourself. There's, there's nothing wrong with expressing your emotions and feelings to God. But then where does he want to take you? Look at how the psalm ends. Let me read verses 16 through 18. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. That's a far cry from verse 1. Where are you, God? Why do you hide your face, O God? What's happened? How did David get from, where are you? I don't see you at all in this world, to you're the king forever and ever. Has all the injustice that he was crying out about been reconciled? Has the, has the d- corruption and brokenness that he saw in verse 1 now been fixed in verse 16? Class? No. <laughs> no. No. Not at all. In fact, not, the circumstances haven't changed. I would suggest David probably still feels like God is hidden. God is far away. But he's declaring what he knows to be true in his mind and heart, despite how he feels in the moment. That is so, so important. We live in a culture that's defined by our feelings and desires. I feel this way, therefore it's true. People say this, right? I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not feeling it, man. I'm not feeling it. What if you applied not feeling it to your marriage, right? I'll tell you, give you, I'll give you a hint. It will go poorly, right? I'm just not feeling it anymore. The Bible says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. It doesn't say if you feel like it. David is saying, right, I I still see injustice. I still see things that I don't know how to reconcile perfectly with what I know about God. I don't feel like he's present with me and making a difference, but I know he's good. And I'll declare it to myself. I'll preach what I know to be true to my own heart. Historically speaking, it's those who are closest to God who feel most free to express their complaints to God without fear of retribution, and in doing so, the ones who grow closer to him. One of these people is Corey Ten Boom. How many of you know who Corey Ten Boom is? Ever seen the movie or read the book, The Hiding Place? One of the famous quotes from her book, The Hiding Place, is this, that in darkness, God's truth shines most clearly. Remarkable woman who lived through just unspeakable horrors, but was so full of joy and faith and light and life, you know, in her, in her journals, she talks about the devil, Satan, accusing her, calling her a debtor. Here's what she meant by that. She said, this, even though she was deeply convinced that God is real and God loved her, she, there was, it's hard to get rid of the psychological and emotional and spiritual effects of what she experienced. And there lingered in her mind these accusations, she called them, of darkness. God isn't good. God isn't there. God doesn't love you. God doesn't care. These things would come back to her. And she said the Bible to her was like God's checkbook of promises. And she says you need to write checks to your own heart to cancel those debts that the devil tries to accuse you of. And she actually would do this. She actually would write on little slips of paper promises of God as if you're writing out a check and say, there, that debt is paid. So so tomorrow at work when you feel accused, say, there, devil, write out, (laughs) see what people next to you say. But what a great spiritual practice. This is declaring, this is clinging to faith. To say, I know that's not true. It feels like it, but I know that's not true. I know who my God is. And I will draw on his promises. And by the way, this is exactly what David is doing in the psalm. I don't know if you caught this, but all of the accusations of the wicked that God doesn't see, that God doesn't hear, that God doesn't care, that God won't act or call to account, David answers in the promises of God to the afflicted. Did you catch that? We see it right here in verse 14. But you do see. You do take notice. You will take it into your hands. In verse 17. O Lord, you do hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. 
David is answering the accusations of the wicked with the promises to the afflicted. Our faith, then and now, depends on the strength of God's promises. Can you count on them? Are they real? God sees, God hears, God knows, God cares, and God will act. Uh, if you were here last night, you, we had a, an event called Micah 6 8 from the Old Testament prophet Micah uh, about God's heart for justice in the world, related to this psalm in many ways. That's what this artwork here from Catherine Tilly is all about. Uh, we talked about God's vision and heart for, for justice. And one of the passages that we looked at last night is in the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. If you've got your Bible, you can turn there real quick. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet, and he's weeping not because he's depressed all the time, but because he's broken over his own people's sin and rebellion, the way they treat each other. And, and he, God speaking to the prophet here in chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. How many of you would say, I asked this question last night, I'll ask it of you now. How many of you would say you, you would like to know God better than you know him right now? Anybody? How many of you would say, I already know God perfectly? <laughs> I just want to see if anybody goes, oh, yeah, whatever you say, I'll put my hand up for. Right? I think all of us would like to know more of God's heart, understand him more, know him more, to be closer to him than we are at the, in this moment. And God longs for that to be true. And the prophet tells us how that is to happen. Don't bo he says, if you boast, let, don't boast in your wealth, knowledge, or power. Boast does not mean possess. It doesn't mean it's wrong to have money, to have wisdom, or to have influence or power. Boasting means to place your trust in, to make it what you count on. Let, if you want to boast, boast in one thing. Place your trust in, count on one thing, that you know me. Well, how do we know him? He tells you. I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, who does justice and righteousness in the earth. These are the things I delight in. This is how you know me. The God of justice, the God of mercy, the God of compassion, the God of the oppressed, the father of the fatherless. If you want to know the heart of God, and I'm preaching this to you as somebody who needs to hear it. Sometimes I want to have my nose in the book, study. This is good. You should be reading the word and studying. But one of the best ways to know the heart of God is to get around the people he identifies most with. And you know who that is? Those at the bottom of the ladder. This, by the way, is utterly unique in the, in, in the, in the world of pagan ancient, ancient gods. All the gods of the Old Testament did not identify with those at the bottom of the ladder. They're at the bottom because they're cursed by God. They identify with those at the top of the social strata and power because they're blessed by God. Only the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of, of the, of the ch Christian church, only our God says, you want to get close to me? Get close to those I care most about, those that are oppressed, those that are forgotten, those that are, as David says, afflicted. That's where you'll find me. That's where you'll know me and understand what I'm really like. Because by the way, that's who you were before I found you. That's the kind of person you are without my grace. This is what God's telling us. And, and David then is declaring to himself what he knows to be true, despite how it feels, but we have an advantage over David. We have something to strengthen our faith David did not have. Do you know what it is? Anybody? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yes, good job. Right? I, know, I know maybe you think I'm being silly. It's so, so important. David looked forward in anticipation of what he hoped God would do. We look back in certainty to what he has done, the cross. The cross is God's answer to the question in Psalm 10, verse 1. Where are you, God? Why do you hide, God? Why don't you come do something, God? And God has told us in Christ, I have. I have. I have conquered sin and death. I have defeated the powers of darkness. I know you don't see it fully yet, but I have. You can take that to the bank. You can count on that. All of God's promises, we're told in the New Testament, are yes and amen in Christ. John Stott, in his book, The Cross of Christ, said, I could never believe in a God who was immune to suffering. 
And therefore, I could not believe in God without the cross. Because the cross tells us God is not immune to it. He not only identifies theoretically with the poor and oppressed in the Old Testament, he so identifies with the poor and oppressed that he became poor and oppressed. When he came into the world, he came into the world as he was victimized, unjustly executed, came as the most vulnerable. This is how you know him. So we cling to faith. We know that God sees, we know that God cares, and that he will act because he has acted in Jesus. So we cry out to God and we cling to faith. Is that it? We stop there? Do we just kind of cling to faith and hold on? I know it, life is terrible, but I'm just kind of clinging on until he comes back. No, actually. One more thing. We continue to work. We cry out to God honestly. We cling to faith despite how it feels. And we continue to work for his purposes and kingdom, for justice. I, I truly believe that serving others is one of the best ways to strengthen your faith. Read the Bible, absolutely. Study with friends, pray in community, yes. But one of the best ways for you to grow and strengthen your faith is to get outside of yourself, to start giving some of your time and resources away for God's glory and the good of others. Last night, Arloa Sutter, who's the founder of Breakthrough Urban Ministries, was here, standing on the stage telling us some stories about how that ministry started. I encourage you to go look her up and look up Breakthrough Urban Ministries in the Garfield Park area of west side of Chicago, a remarkable, amazing ministry that began when she had a cup of coffee with a homeless man. God moved in her heart, and now something really beautiful is happening there that happened through that encounter. She knows God in ways that I long to, not because necessarily she studied more, because she's been around people. She's met God where he is, present with the poor. I mentioned going into Zambia and how driving along, looking out the window, we were, I was overwhelmed. I felt, almost, I felt kind of like David a little bit in verse 1. Where are you, God, in all of this sea of need? Where are you? Well, I'll tell you where we met him. We went into that house. My wife and I, with the representative of the hospital, we found our way through these narrow streets, and we, I could hardly believe the van fit down these streets, and we got out of the van and walked up the, the, down to this little house. I mean, if you could call it a house, it was a dirt hovel, really. One little mom, three little kids in a one-room, tiny little place with a little boy that was recovering from his surgery. And she told us to a translator with joy, about the, uh, with light in her eyes, about the healing of her son. We felt the presence of God in that little dirt hovel in that little corner of the continent of Africa in this world. Palpable presence of God. That's where God is. And you don't have to go to Zambia to find him. He's on your street as well, in your home too. Let me ask this question then, if we continue to work. How does God bring justice into the world? How? How does God bring comfort to the fatherless? How does God bring protection to the vulnerable? How does God bring justice? You notice in verse 15, it says, break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Did you hear David say that? David kind of had a, an issue with violence. <laughs> break the arm. What is he saying? Well, David wants all of the bad people to have compound fractures in their right arm so we could know them because they all have slings on, right? No. I remember this old Irish blessing that said, Lord, for those who love us, may they love us. And those who hate us, may you break their hearts. If you can't break their hearts, please break their ankles so we'll know them by their limp. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. He's not praying that. He's saying the arm is, is the Hebrew way of talking about someone's power, strength. The arm of the Lord is mighty to save. He's saying break the power and strength of the wicked to do evil in the world. Stop it. How does God stop it? Does he just magically from heaven? If, if, if someone is hungry, how does God feed them? Well, he did drop manna at one point in the Old Testament, but I don't see a lot of that today. How? How, friends, does God comfort the fatherless and the lonely, protect the vulnerable, break the power of injustice and evil in the world? How does he do it? Yes, thank you. I know. You're not, we're going to start answering out loud in church more. <laughs> Through us. Remember when Gary Haugen was here from International Justice Mission? He said, we're the plan, and there's no plan B, which makes you go, ah. We, it's us. How many of you have ever felt God's comfort in a time when you felt lonely and isolated through another person? Show of hands. I have. How many of you have ever felt we're in need, desperate need, and God provided for you through someone else? When we read David saying, God, do these things, how's he going to do it? How's he going to do it? You and I, the, we, the church, are how he's going to do it. 
Someday he will return and he'll right every wrong, wipe every tear, and, and, and the world will be full of justice and mercy and righteousness and glory and light. Between this day and that day, his plan to bring justice in the world is you. You have a role to play. You have work to do. And he longs for you to join him in doing it. Paul, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 57 through 58 He's talking about how God has conquered the powers of darkness on the cross. And he says in verse 57 then, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It's because of the cross and the resurrection. It's because that Jesus has already conquered the power of darkness that we can continue to work knowing that it's not in vain. Otherwise, if that's not true, it's just, I mean, that little boy in Africa, that's just a drop in the bucket in the sea of need. But we serve a God who has already won, who will right every wrong. And he invites us to continue to work with him and for him. So what can we really do? Three things and then we'll, we'll come to the table. What can you do? Because I, I, like me, you probably feel like, well, that's fine, theoretically, Pastor Jeff, but what can I do about this? Three things. You can get to know the afflicted. And in doing so, you'll get to know God. It's sadly, in our suburban, affluent culture of comfort, it's possible, even common, for some of us to live insulated lives and not to know people in real desperate situations. And that ought not to be. We can get to know them. You can do that through our Shepherd's Heart ministry, our Masterpiece ministry, by going down to the Garfield Center and working with Breakthrough Urban Ministries. There's lots of opportunities. Number two, you can pray for the afflicted. You can make it part of your daily prayer to pray for those in our community who are vulnerable, who are weak, who are hurting. And number three, you can partner with those who are already at work. That's why we have local partners. You can get on our website or our app and click the Serve the World section or our local partners and find places where you could go even if it's once a month, to show up. And in doing so, you're not just doing a good deed. You're going to know God. You're going to understand him better. And be part of his work in the world. We are the plan. Thanks be to God who has given us the victory in Jesus Christ. So we're going to come to his table as we close. And we're going to celebrate his victory over sin and death. My sin, your sin, our sin, and the powers of darkness in the world that he, he defeated them at the cross and has given us hope with the resurrection. And it doesn't matter to us if you're a member here, a regular tender, if it's your first Sunday here. If you know Jesus as your Savior, if you've trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins and you've turned your life over to him, it doesn't mean you have it all together, but you've placed your trust in Jesus. You are welcome at his table. After I pray, the ushers will come and, and serve you. You'll get two cups stacked together. Just hold them in your hands. Once we've all been served, I'll come back up and lead us through taking the elements. Let's bow. God, you are the God of justice and righteousness in the earth, and these are the things you delight. And you have given to us who deserve condemnation and punishment. You've given us hope and healing and restoration. You, God, who deserve justice and vindication and glory, took our condemnation. You became a victim and marginalized and oppressed and vulnerable so that we might be brought into your family and sent into your world. Now as we come to your table, Lord, speak the words to our hearts that we long and need to hear. Lord Jesus, our King and our Redeemer. Amen.